good afternoon, good morning, good evening, depending on when, where you are in the world at this moment. And thanks to everyone who joined this event today. Also to those who will be uh, watching this video later due to the different time zones. So it's a pleasure to start the 2021 CM's Dialogues series with the presentation of one of the most relevant products developed by the um, Red List of, Ecom uh, of Ecosystem Thematic Group with the leadership of uh, Professor David Keith, Emily Nicholson, and the group of contributors who will participate as panelists in this session. And they will be introduced uh, later. As you know, um, uh, today, uh, 100 resolutions and recommendations have been adopted by electronic vote last October in the run up to the Congress in Marseille. Uh, the resolution 61 related, uh, relates to the partnerships and further development of a global ecosystem typology, um, which uh, encourages council IUCN Council to promote and support the application of the global ecosystem typology to support global, regional, national efforts to assess and manage risks uh, to ecosystems, support the application of the red list of ecosystems, um, a criteria to assess risk of collapse in the world's uh, thematic priority ecosystems. Um, the, the, this resolution also uh, gives a specific mandate to our commission that refers to um, continue mapping the distribution of the global ecosystem typology uh, related to terrestrial freshwater and oceanic environments, identification of contributions of the world's major ecosystem types to a diverse suite of services and or benefits contributing to human health and well-being. And finally, the development of innovative educational material, including print and web-based publications and other web-based resources that provide access to ecosystem information. So with this, I think um, that this is a very good opportunity to, to learn from David and, and the full team who contributed to the development of the typology on where we are, what are the main results that we have so far? What are the potential contributions of, the, um, of this uh, global ecosystem typology to the um, global challenges that we have at the moment and to the IUCN program that is already is under this uh, final uh, process for electronic vote uh, up to mid-February, uh, I guess. Uh, and, and the potential applications of the red list of ecosystems for uh, to achieve the sustainable development goals and all the main uh, commitments that we have uh, during this decade. So with that short introduction, I, I would like to give the, the, um, the floor to David who will be presenting and he will also be presenting the group of panelists who will be participating uh, today in this session. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Angela. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be able to um, speak to you about this topic uh, at this stage of its development. Um, sometimes I never thought we'd get there. I'm going to um, share my screen now. Um, okay, and hopefully you can see that. And uh, I, I especially want to acknowledge, um, you know, we've had more than 100 um, contributors to uh, to this typology. I've listed the four authors of the IUCN publication that's now available through the IUCN library website. But uh, actually we've we've had a huge network of, uh, of collaborators to help us build this thing and um, the contributions of, of those people are, are very greatly acknowledged. It's been a great privilege actually for us to work with them all. And, uh, and we hope that um, you know, going through that process of development is uh, something that establishes an ongoing network of, of collaboration on, uh, on ecosystems. Um, 
also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that um, that I'm presenting from today. Um, I'm on Durrawal country here in Australia. Um, for this session, we've organised it into, into three parts and we'll have a break for uh, discussion and question and answers um, in between each of the, the three parts. So uh, here's a list of what we plan so you know what's coming. Um, <clears throat> first of all, we're going to talk about the policy context, um, the development of the typology and, and its structure. Uh, and in the second session, uh, we're going to explore uh, the typology, uh, the different web, uh, the different ecosystems that are represented within it um, and demonstrate the website uh, that we've built to, to accompany the typology. And uh, after another discussion, um, we will talk about uh, applications, what we can use this for and indeed uh, some of the initiatives that are currently underway um, that draw upon various aspects of the typology. Um, so we have a panel uh, of, uh, of people to help us with that discussion. And um, I won't introduce you to them right now, but um, at the end of uh, this first part um, and at the beginning of our first discussion session, Emily Nicholson is, is going to introduce everyone on the panel. Okay, so let's get on with part one. The policy context. Um, Angela has mentioned already the um, resolution that was passed um, late last year um, at the World Conservation Congress. And I just wanted to highlight a few of the key elements that are that are taken from that resolution. The first is that the typology is there to support uh, the assessment and management of risks to ecosystems. The resolution also says that uh, the typology will help support uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals and biodiversity targets in the post 2020 agenda. It commits to continued efforts on mapping to improve the representation, spatial representation of these ecosystems around the planet. And uh, another um, item on the agenda is for the future is to identify the contributions of the world's ecosystems to ecosystem services. And finally, um, it commits to developing um, innovative educational resources um, for a wide range of, of um, users. So just picking up on, on the first of those um, points from the resolution uh, to support efforts to assess and manage risks to ecosystems. Um, that's really been one of our central goals and underlying themes uh, throughout this project. And uh, really there's, there's two things that we needed a typology to, to do in order for it to be able to serve that purpose. The first is to enable generalizations about ecosystem change. And our approach is that by grouping ecosystems that share similar functional traits, um, similar threats, similar drivers and similar indicators, um, we may be able to make those generalizations in a reliable way. So a key feature of this, um, this typology is that it incorporates both ecosystem function as well as the composition of the biota that, that make up the ecosystems. And I'll explain that as we go along, how those two important components are integrated into the typology. Um, another consideration um, or property that we needed the ecosystem to, to meet uh, in order to serve its purpose is that it needed to be comprehensive throughout the entire biosphere. And finally, it also needs to be scalable uh, because the applications that are required of, of, uh, for ecosystem management and also policy development extend from the global scale um, right down through national to the local scale. Now, the, the second major goal that we had in mind um, was to facilitate translation across existing typologies. Um, by no means were we starting from scratch. Um, there has been a very substantial effort um, or collection of efforts uh, worldwide on the development of ecological typologies and classifications. And um, it makes no sense to ignore that or, or to throw it away. Um, so one of our core aims was to leverage those past investments and the current usage 
and uh, and buy-in into those typologies um, and to build on that in developing something that's truly global. And uh, so to bring those together, um, we've endeavoured to develop a common terminology and a comparative framework. And at the same time, um, tried to find um, solutions and, and, and structures and tools that are parsimonious, simple, and very well documented. So um, the development process, um, I'm not going to go in, into in, in much detail, but um, it's uh, we're now three and a half years, I guess, since we, we first got together to discuss um, this idea in London um, at King's College in May uh, 2017. And uh, one of the early tasks was to review existing typologies, um, which we've done, and we'll be reporting that out on that in a publication, um, hopefully shortly. Um, we, um, we established thematic working groups for terrestrial, freshwater and marine ecosystems. And um, we had regular meetings between the leads of those, those working groups to ensure that um, there was um, flow of information and, and consistency as the typology took shape. Um, we first developed a candidate list of units for levels one to three of the typology, um, which has a hierarchical structure. You'll see that a little later. And, uh, and we began drafting uh, descriptive profiles in, in those working groups. And those profiles and the structure of the typology went through a, an iterative review and revision process through four cycles, uh, somewhat exhaustive. And, uh, and that um, led to the um, development of a, um, a, a resolution which was adopted um, that we just, um, just saw from Angela and previous slide. Um, in late December, um, IUCN released the publication of the typology um, and, uh, and the website uh, that supports that publication and users of the typology has also become available uh, this month. Uh, we're working towards a series of scientific publications and uh, hopefully we'll see those emerging this year. Uh, so there's a couple of them that are in the advanced um, review stage. And finally, um, we've embarked um, on a number of partnerships with, um, with uh, various players to explore some of the diverse applications um, of the typology. And I'll be um, giving you a splash of those in part three of, uh, of this dialogue. So to introduce the, the scope and the structure of um, the typology, um, as I said, it's intended to be comprehensive um, uh, and encompass all ecosystems of, of the biosphere. And that's really one of its innovations. Many of the existing typologies that, um, that we reviewed covered uh, you know, one portion of, of the biosphere. And so there was actually very few that um, were able to encompass um, the entire planet in a single framework uh, that was consistent across marine, um, terrestrial and freshwater environments. Um, the structure is, is hierarchical. There are six levels that you can see represented here. And in essence, the upper three levels, realms, biomes and functional groups are designed to represent different aspects of um, ecosystem function in varying levels of detail and resolution. And they're essentially uh, developed from the top down. So we had our first discussions about defining what the realms were across the planet um, and, uh, and then asked the question within each realm, um, what bio biomes do we need to recognize and so on. Now the three uh, lower levels of the typology are intended to represent um, the composition, the different expressions of those functionally similar groups of ecosystems around the world. And uh, those three levels um, go into different approaches um, in terms of you know, how we might recognise those different expressions. And um, essentially level four is a, um, a shortcut um, 
method leveraging work that's already been done on global ecoregions, whereas um, level five is the longer route, more thorough, and hopefully something that will lead to a more reliable product that is established from the bottom up. Um, and the bottom up being level six, um, which uh, is a placeholder in effect for all of the existing uh, detailed typologies that exist um, at the national scale in different parts of the world. So one way of viewing this is as a synthetic framework um, by which, which we can use um, to, to bring together these um, independently developed classifications at uh, a high level of detail. So I'll just take you through uh, the, the major levels, um, particularly the top three, which has been our major focus in the development of the topology uh, to this point. Uh, realms are the major components of the biosphere that differ fundamentally in ecosystem organisation and function. In essence, they represent different media. Uh, there are four core realms, um, terrestrial, freshwaters, marine and subterranean realms. And we also have a placeholder for atmospheric systems, which is something that uh, came out of discussions during development of um, natural capital accounting systems um, through um, the United Nations. And uh, this is an interesting area that uh, very little is currently known. And in fact, uh, there's even some fundamental work that needs to be done to establish um, the characteristics of the atmosphere that, um, that warrant its recognition as, as a type of ecosystem. Uh, but in fact, uh, there are certainly needs to, um, to um, manage and report on the atmosphere as we know, uh, particularly through the, um, the management of greenhouse gases. So there's certainly some important further development work to be done there. Um, one of the major constraints of a typology is that it slots things into boxes. And as people, as humans, um, that's a convenient way for us to think. And um, inherently we have a deep psychological um, uh, need, I suppose, to understand the world and our social environment by classifying things. And so classifications are very useful tools from that perspective. On the other hand, um, we have a natural world that um, doesn't fit into boxes very well. And in fact, uh, the boxes, boxes are very messy with things hanging out of them and spilling over into other boxes. In other words, um, nature is continuous um, by nature. And so um, we have this tension between a framework that is fundamentally discrete um, in its structure, um, classifying into units, that is trying to represent something that doesn't look like that at all. Um, it's much more continuous. And we've tried to, um, to soften that conflict and, and deal with um, the continuous um, properties of nature by recognising uh, the fact that um, these are not discrete units and that um, in some cases we've been able to recognise transitional units between the major groups. And in fact, that's exactly what we've done at the realm level, um, where there are not only these four um, core realms, but uh, the transitional combinations between them. And so you'll see that um, we have a realm that represents the transition, for example, between terrestrial and freshwater environments. The second level of the typology um, deals with biomes. Now, these are components of realms that are united by very broad uh, features of ecosystem structure and one or more um, uh, common major ecological drivers. So there are 25 biomes recognised in the typology at present. And uh, you can see the breakdown there across terrestrial, freshwater and marine um, and so on. Uh, there's a significant number of transitional um, biomes that you can see there. Nine out of the 25 are transitional. And it's also worth pointing out that uh, the typology is not limited to um, to so-called natural um, ecosystems. Um, human influence extends across the entire um, biosphere. 
uh, but some ecosystems uh, have a much stronger stamp of human influence than, than others. And so we have six of the 25 um, biomes recognised as anthropogenic biomes that are actually constructed by humans and also maintained by human activity. So in other words, uh, they wouldn't exist if it wasn't for proactive development by humans. And uh, unless there is continuum, continued maintenance in some fashion, uh, these ecosystems are likely to transition into some other state. So these, uh, these anthropogenic uh, biomes are um, very important because some parts of the world are largely made up, made up of anthropogenic systems now. And uh, much of the focus of ecosystem management is on those systems. The third level is what we call ecosystem functional groups. And to, to a large degree, uh, this is the engine room of, uh, of the typology. Um, it's the one that really is the most powerful for uh, synthesis and for communication and comparison. And ecosystem functional groups are groups of related ecosystems within a biome that share common ecological drivers that shape similar biotic traits that then characterise the group. And the current version of the typology, version 2.0, has 108 um, functional groups recognised. Uh, and you can again see the breakdown there across the different realms, uh, terrestrial, freshwater, marine, subterranean. And again, quite a large uh, proportion, uh, about a quarter of them, are uh, transitional realms. And we have a significant component, a significant number of those are um, anthropogenic functional groups, 15 out of the 108. And uh, these diagrams that you see here, um, illustrated on the right, of the screen are examples of, um, of conceptual assembly models that identify the major components of the ecosystems and the processes that uh, then that keep those, those systems operate, operating. Um, we'll say a little bit more about those um, later on. But essentially each functional group has a unique assembly model that identifies those um, distinctive elements and processes that characterise the group. Now levels four to six are still under development. Um, level four, as I mentioned earlier, um, we can think of as a shortcut to um, global units that may be useful for representing biodiversity in the first instance. And uh, these recognise different expressions of functional groups uh, across different eco-regions eco of the world. So in a spatial sense, uh, essentially they are intersections um, with some work of, um, of resolving um, anomalies um, from a broad intersection uh, between ecosystem functional groups and eco-regions, which are well-known um, biogeographic um, units, well-established in, uh, in conservation circles worldwide. Uh, level six um, down the base of the typology is, as I said, a placeholder for integrating established national and subnational classifications into the framework. And uh, you can see a couple of examples here of established um, national classifications from Chile and uh, also South Africa. And uh, we have representatives on, on the panel uh, that work with these data sets that um, have been developed over a very long period of time. It's taken decades to build these, uh, these uh, data infrastructures that are central to the management of ecosystems in those countries. And so it's very important that we recognize and, and build on those efforts and try to integrate them into a global framework. And one of the um, advantages of doing so is so that we can make comparisons across borders. And finally, level five in between those two is, uh, is if you like, um, a global scale uh, ecosystem level uh, group of units that represent both functions and biotic composition. 
and level five is um, or will be derived by uh, aggregating upwards from level six. So we have sort of contrasting approaches. Level four comes from the top down, level five comes from the bottom up and uh, there's much work to be done on that uh, into the future, but um, ultimately um, in the years ahead, um, we should see a, uh, a very substantial um, information resource developing uh, across the globe that integrates um, all that fantastic work that's um, been happening at the national level. So uh, that's a very quick introduction to the, uh, the structure of the typology and some of the thinking that that's gone into the development. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and uh, we'll have time for discussion and questions before we go on to a demonstration of the website and an exploration of typology in, in more detail. Um, but uh, before I do, uh, before we go into uh, discussion, um, I'm going to ask Emily Nicholson if she can introduce the panel members. Thanks, Emily. Thank you. Um, I'm just trying to work out <clears throat> if I can share my screen. Apologies. And I'm hoping you can see that slide. Um, I just wanted to quickly introduce our panelists for today um, <clears throat> who come from a diverse um, range of backgrounds uh, and roles within the, the typology. Um, first of all, um, I'll just run through their names. We've got obviously David, um, myself, Emily Nicholson from Deakin University in Australia, Richard Kingsford, also from University of New South Wales, uh, Dr. Kate Watermeyer from Deakin University, Andres Etta uh, from Colombia, Patricio Pliskov from the Catholic University of Chile, uh, Nicholas Murray from James Cook University, uh, Patrick Bogard from uh, Statistics Netherlands, and Andrew Scono from Sandby in South Africa, and Hedley Grantham from WCS. And together, the panellists um, represent, um, most of them uh, were involved in the development of the typology to varying degrees. And we have, for example, uh, Richard uh, really focusing and developing a lot of the aspects relating to freshwater and Kate very involved in the marine system. So if you have any questions that specifically relate to those, um, you may want to direct them towards them. Uh, and then we also have um, a, a range of panellists representing different user groups. So people who, for example, in the case of Andres, Patricio, uh, Patrick and Andrew and Headley are all uh, trying to apply uh, the typology to existing typology uh, ecosystem classifications in their various countries or parts of the world, uh, while also Nick and Headley have been involved in developing um, new ecosystem classifications and maps with the support of the, the ecosystem typology um, to, to help uh, uh, characterise those ecosystems and describe them. Uh, I think I'll leave it there unless anyone wants to add anything, but they'll be available to, um, to help answer any questions. Thank you. And on that note, does anyone have any questions for David or are they in the chat at the moment? Okay, so um, if, um, sorry, if the users wants to have uh, to ask some question, there is a question and answer icon on the low bar. So you, you can put your questions here, write your questions down and then we can read them and go through them. So, so there's, in, sorry, there's one question about, uh, from Charles Shore about the, um, uh, the application of the typology for restoration. And another question about Joseph, uh, from Joseph Potvin about um, whether the areas uh, can overlap, areas of ecosystem. 
Yeah. Um, the restoration question, I think um, we could possibly ask uh, Andres to, um, to uh, comment on. Um, and while he's thinking about that, I, um, I might take the second question about areas overlapping. Um, you'll see in the next session when we demonstrate the, uh, the website that um, we have tried to separate the process of classifying ecosystems uh, from representing their spatial distribution in maps. And the maps that we have at present, um, we have chosen as, um, as representations of the concepts of the functional groups from available mapping. Um, and in some cases, we've uh, manipulated those maps um, or included some uh, processing steps to make them a better match to the concept. Um, so in essence, each of the 108 um, functional groups has a map. Um, you'll see some examples of those shortly. And at present, because of the global scale resolution of the maps, it is possible for um, the distributions represented to uh, overlap. So that doesn't mean that um, the two ecosystem functional groups can occur in exactly the same place. It simply means that um, that more than one um, ecosystem, uh, two or more, um, might be juxtaposed within a local area. Okay. So in that sense, um, when you're viewing global maps, they do appear to overlap, but um, that's simply a representation of, of the scale of the maps uh, for the reality on the ground where they won't overlap. Um, Andres, would you like to um, make any comments about restoration applications? Uh, bearing in mind that we'll probably talk about this some more in, in part three. Well, yes, uh, good afternoon from here, from Colombia. Yeah, uh, I think the, the one of the, of the main aspects of this typology is besides describing and representing ecosystems is really the application towards uh, the management, planning and management of, of ecosystems. And in that sense, both restoration, conservation within land use planning are essential to it. Uh, I would say that um, uh, one important aspect is uh, this uh, global ecosystem typology has to also to be taken together with the red list of ecosystems, which both uh, together will provide the framework to better assess the risks and um, threats to ecosystems, and uh, certainly one of the of the of the big uh, uh, major uh, aspects of this typology is the possibility really to to um, walk across national boundaries, which is one of the of the main uh, um, issues nowadays, and which has been somehow stopping also the, the possibility to, to, for joint uh, uh, partnered restoration and conservation actions. So I would say uh, certainly one of the, of the main uh, uh, aspects of this typology is to, to serve as a, as a, as a base to, to, uh, to, for restoration and conservation, of course. Okay, there's another question about, uh, as a from Janet Franklin, about uh, the vision for further development, refinement, and versioning of the typology beyond the second version. Yeah, I, thanks for that question, Janet. I think we might defer that to the third part uh, because I do have a slide on um, on some ideas about where we might go from here. Um, Yeah, Joseph has a, a question. Um, is anyone currently working on associating ongoing satellite um, data uh, with the shape files? Um, maybe Nick, you might be um, a good person to comment on this because of your work on data cubes that um, integrate ecosystem mapping with, um, with time series of satellite images. 
Sure. Um, yeah, I work a lot with, with developing global maps of ecosystems. And in, in terms of the specific question about associating satellite data, um, which I assume is sort of continuous um, measures of the environment from a satellite such as Landsat, summarizing them to the existing maps at the global scale. I haven't, I haven't heard of anyone who has been doing that, um, but there has been a lot of work to summarize those maps into, into data cubes that uh, allow a sort of um, more standardized way of viewing the, the layers that we've produced. Uh, I see also that Jose wants to answer that question, so he might have a, have a deeper answer than that. Yeah, yeah, well, um, yes, uh, we have been working on, on summarizing the information of the distribution of the of the different units. So this is an, an ongoing work. Um, and we have a, a lot of um, pending questions about the, the mapping of, of the units at the different levels, and how to use this information for assessment of the of the units. Um, using special indicators of change, or so special temporal indicators of, of change. So this is uh, an area of active development, and, and we expect that uh, during this year we will have some, as so we will focus on the maps for the level three and start to work on the level four of the topology. But it's uh, obviously this will require in the future that a, a large network of, of collaborators uh, work at different levels from from the um, national units to the towards the global units to achieve a better um, better assessment of the changes in distribution and and any changes in in uh, function uh, of the ecosystems yeah so most of uh the remaining questions are about either data availability or applications. Um, just briefly, I think um, we can say that, um, you know, if there's a single um, primary intent for the typology, it's to support ecosystem management. Um, but the fact that the typology has a hierarchical structure and integrates the different elements that it does integrate means that you know there's a number of other applications that um, that could be served by the typology so um, and we're seeing that kind of uptake already um, which is something that we'll discuss in um, in part three of the dialogue uh, in terms of data availability, um, there's questions about the spatial data. The, the spatial data are already available. Um, they're really suitable for, for global use at this point. Um, although because the data come from different sources, uh, some of those sources are, are potentially suitable for finer scale application than, than others. And we'll see some examples of, of that shortly. And in fact, I think um, given the time, we should probably move on to uh, to the next session. So I'll share my screen again. Uh, okay. So part two, um, I think um, some of you may have um, discovered the, um, the typology website already, but uh, this is uh, what the landing page looks like. And um, the address is here, uh, global-ecosystems.com. <clears throat> and uh, we'll go there uh, right now. Um, But uh, in essence, uh, just in case, um, I'll give you a quick overview of, of the functionality. It enables us to explore the structure of the typology, um, do um, basic thematic and spatial searches, um, and some basic map queries and basic spatial analyses. 
Um, and it's only just gone live la uh, last month. Um, so uh, hopefully it's, it's holding up okay. Now, I'm just gonna change my shared screen so that we can actually get into uh, the website. So. Okay, so hopefully you can see that now. Uh, this is the page that you, let you land on. You can get back to it by, um, by clicking on this box here. Um, okay, um, so let's uh, just explore along the menus. Um, the About tab uh, gives you the information about how to cite the website. Um, it gives you some links to um, related um, information about the typology, including the publication through the IUCN library, uh, and, uh, and also the uh, spatial data, which is available through this link. Um, and that's, um, that's working now. It's been available publicly for, for some time. And uh, we'd especially like to acknowledge Dunpark um, Information Design that, um, that really um, did a great job on the design of the, uh, the typology website. Moving along to the next tab about the methods, it gives you a brief synopsis um, about the development of the typology. Um, pretty much the same information that I gave you earlier. We held a number of workshops around the world. Those are listed there in the development of the typology and, um, and also some text about the review process. And uh, importantly, some explanatory information about the development of the indicative distribution maps. We call them indicative because exactly that's exactly what they are. Um, I mentioned before that there are a number of caveats and that those limitations differ somewhat depending on the source of the primary data. Um, but nonetheless, uh, those maps are, are the best match to concept that we are able to, uh, to locate. Uh, at the present time. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm just going to have to. Uh, the typology website also has a glossary of terms. Uh, some of the descriptions of, uh, of different ecosystems have some technical terms, and these are all explained here in, in the glossary. So uh, if there are things that you don't understand that um, that actually relate to quite important characteristics um, related to ecosystem functions, then uh, you should be able to find them in, in these, um, this list here, which is alphabetically arranged, uh, also with uh, some tables at, at the bottom about um, the descriptors for productivity and, and also for leaf size in, um, in terrestrial ecosystems with vegetation. Um, Next, I'm going to uh, to jump across to um, to the typology tab here, and um, this is where the um, the structure of the typology is outlined. Um, we will have um, the hierarchical diagram um, loaded onto this page in due course, but the definitions, the formal definitions of the upper three levels, are here and the explanation of the purpose uh, that I took you through in, in the earlier session for the lower levels of the typology is, is described here. Now, probably the, the major um, sort of component of the website uh, content is here under the Explore tab. And this is where you can jump in and start to look at the, uh, the different characteristics of contrasting ecosystem types. And the explore function is arranged hierarchically um, in the same way as, um, as the typology itself. And um, you can see here icons for each of the realms, uh, the four core realms, as well as the six transitional realms amongst them. So, um, so we can uh, choose any one of those. And um, <clears throat> here we have the terrestrial realm and you'll see at the realm level, we have um, illustrative um, images of the ecosystem, as well as some descriptive text. And within each realm, uh, there are a series of biomes and uh, you can access those either through these photographic icons 
um, that give you some idea about the nature of uh, each of those different biomes or from the list here on the right hand side. They both lead to the same place. Um, <clears throat> so if you click on a particular biome, um, again, you'll see an illustrative image and also some, uh, some descriptive text about the major features of that particular biome. In this case, tropical, subtropical um, moist forests. And uh, then you will see, once again, another menu uh, for the next level of, of the typology. Um, in this um, biome, we have four functional groups, which are shown here and also listed here. And once again, uh, the links in both places lead you to the same place. So if we uh, click on one of those, um, just as an example, tropical lowland rainforests, uh, the information that you'll see includes uh, the map. And um, as I said, these are you know, the best available um, maps uh, that we were able to match to concept. And sometimes there were trade-offs with the spatial resolution or uh, you know, some other aspect. And um, in some cases, there were multiple spatial data layers that we could use to um, improve um, the match to concept of a particular spatial data set. Um, now you can enlarge the map and uh, it has a zoom feature. Um, I'll just go full screen here. Um, uh, David, and, sorry to interrupt you. Just um, you might want to close your bookmark so we can see the map in greater detail. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's better. I I just have um, I've got a uh, a couple of other things open that are obstructing my view. So, and I want to uh, to keep the chat open if I can. So, excuse that if you can. Um, Okay, so here is, is uh, the, um, the map. And uh, as I said, there is a zoom function, which you can operate over here. Um, you can also do it with um, the mouse, which is what I'm doing now, and zoom in to uh, a particular part of the world to see the estimated spatial distribution. Um, now you'll see two different colors represented here. The darker red is um, is what we might call major occurrences, and the pale red is uh, is areas that um, there are minor occurrences of uh, this ecosystem functional group, but typically um, there's substantial areas um, of other ecosystems in these mapped sort of pale red areas. So they make up a, a relatively minor portion of, of the landscape. Um, you also see, um, as you zoom out, um, there are blue lines, and that's uh, simply as indicators to show um, places where um, ecosystems occur that may not be obvious um, at the scale. You can see these kinds of forests are throughout Polynesia, and uh, you don't really see the red until you zoom in uh, to those. Uh, so that's why we have that, uh, those blue line outlines. Uh, to help users. Um, you can see um, that um, the, um, the map data is limited in spatial resolution. The primary purpose at this stage is to, um, is to illustrate global distributions. Although down the track, um, it should be possible for us to link up with level six and show much more um, reliable and also um, high resolution um, maps that are derived from data sets at the national scale. But just looking here at uh, tropical rainforests in Madagascar, for example, we can zoom in and, uh, and see the core and minor um, areas of, of distribution there. And uh, we can also um, use the, um, the satellite imagery and, um, and vary the opacity of um, the outline so that we can see um, various features represented on the satellite imagery. 
um, but you'll see here that um, the resolution of, of the map data is such that uh, you know we have a bit of spillover into the ocean. Clearly, tropical forests don't occur in the ocean, uh, but that's one of one example of the kinds of limitations that we bump into um, once we reach the spatial resolution of the maps. So there is a zoom in facility, but uh, but clearly there are limits to um, the application uh, at this stage from the existing spatial data. Um, the other uh, data that we have that's um, that's uh, on the website in this uh, this mapping application is that um, we do have country boundaries, so um, they can be switched on and off, and they allow you to um, examine the occurrence of um, of different ecosystem types in um, in different national jurisdictions. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump out of the maps now and show you uh, some of the other content that's available on profiles. Um, like realms and biomes, at the functional group level, we have um, illustrative images of uh, an example. Over time, we're hoping to build that into a library um, that show the variation and expressions of uh, the functional group in different places around the world. Um, there's some summary text that gives you a brief synopsis, hopefully in reasonably accessible common language, um, that uh, that give you you know the key features of this ecosystem functional group, and then some more detailed text on the um, on the ecological traits that characterise this group and distinguish it from from other groups. Uh, that's followed by the um, the diagrammatic assembly model which um, identifies the key ecological traits. Uh, tropical forests are obviously highly productive and a number of other traits that they have at the ecosystem level, diversity and so on, and, uh, and also the key drivers. Now, the resources um, are illustrated in the influence of resource availability is illustrated in these pale blue boxes. Um, the ambient environment, um, which includes um, elements like climate, which are not resources per se, uh, but which include factors that um, influence the availability of resources and the ability of, of ecosystems and their biota to, um, to use resources. Um, they are illustrated in these darker blue boxes. Um, we have biotic interactions that are represented in uh, these orange boxes interactions between uh, species, um, trophic relationships, um, predation, herbivory, mutualism, and so on. Uh, disturbance regimes are represented in red. Um, the most common ones are fire on, on terrestrial ecosystems, uh, storms, but, um, but also some other things, particularly um, water regimes, which are very important in freshwater systems. And finally, not illustrated in this particular functional group, um, there are boxes for uh, human influence represented in black that turn up in the profiles for um, anthropogenic ecosystem functional groups. Uh, then we have some more text uh, describing the major drivers um, that uh, really relates to uh, the diagrammatic uh, assembly models there some text distribution, uh, distribution um, information and also an explanation of the, uh, the map data that's been used um, in the maps that you see above. And finally, um, just a couple of key references, um, sources um, that um, enable you to explore further information and get into the scientific literature um, that um, is relevant to these particular functional groups. Okay, I'm going to move over to the uh, analyze function now. And um, this is a place where um, we have some limited um, function, I'm just going to minimize that, uh, limited functionality um, that enables you to um, calculate some area statistics. <clears throat> and uh, probably the most useful, I think, at this point is the, uh, the predefined region. And so you can select. Um, A region, um, and in this case, you know, there's a, a list of countries, and um, 
and I think um, let's um, let's go down and um, have a look at um, uh, Chile, which is uh, where Patricio is from on our panel, and um, we can um, calculate the um, areas of ecosystems represented within Chile. Um, we can also select particular realms that we're interested in. Let's just choose the terrestrial realm at this point. We could um, not specify anything there, in which case we'll get all of the marine systems that are represented within the national borders, including the, the national waters of Chile that you see in the outline here. Okay, and um, we can also choose whether we want only major occurrences or, or minor occurrences as well. Um, Let's just stick with the major ones to keep it simple. And so um, that will give you this table. Um, now, because of the nature of the underlying data and its reliability at, at finer scales, um, which is limited, um, we at present are expressing the representation of ecosystems within national borders as a proportion of the global extent, okay? So you can see here that um, something like um, succulent or thorny deserts and semi-deserts are represented in Chile, but they're a relatively small proportion of the global total. On the other hand, uh, Chile is a major center of occurrence for oceanic uh, cool temperate rainforests. These are the, um, the beach forests, the southern beach forests that occur in Chile. Um, and Chile in fact has um, you know, um, almost half of of the global extent of, of these very important forests. So certainly the most important part of the world for representation of, of that particular group. So you can scroll down and see the full range of, uh, of functional groups represented within that area. You can also download that information into a CSV file. <coughs> um, we can reset the query and, and go and look at another country. Um, again let's have a quick look at somewhere quite different um, let's go to Canada and again uh, we might just stick with terrestrial but with Canada we'll see quite a different um, representation of functional groups here uh, the boreal forests are very important in Canada um, a major segment of, of the global distribution as it is for deciduous temperate forests and, uh, and cool temperate heathlands as well, perhaps not well known, and of course, tundra. So, um, so that will give you a bit of an understanding of, um, of that functionality um, at the national scale. Um, there are other options um, for, um, for different kinds of queries. Um, we can customize an area and, uh, and zoom in, look at a particular place of interest. Um, all right, before I do that. So um, let's have a look at an area with somewhat different kinds of ecosystems um, for this. And, uh, and look at uh, the Caspian Sea here and its surrounds. So the, um, the functionality of, of this particular function is limited to relatively small areas, um, which you'll discover the, the limits of. Um, but um, we might expect to find a range of different freshwater ecosystems represented in and around the Caspian Sea. Now, unlike the, um, the national uh, query function, at this point, we only have um, information about the presence or absence of functional groups, okay, within a particular search area. And um, the reason for that is that we're reaching the limits of um, 
of capability of, of, um, of our web application in, in doing this. And if you want more detailed kinds of spatial analysis, the best place to go will be the raw spatial data to do to do that in a GIS or, or some other kind of software that you need for that particular purpose. But you can see here that you can get a, uh, a quick uh, synopsis of the nature of uh, ecosystems within that particular area. Um, and also um, we can um, reset the query and, um, and actually look for um, things that we might not expect in this place. Now the Caspian Sea is, is a large area that is um, to a large degree isolated from the open ocean. And um, in this case, we might want to check to see if we've got any marine ecosystems uh, represented within that area. So um, let's have a look and search for the marine realm. And uh, we find actually that uh, there are two functional groups represented here. Now, one of them is, is seagrass meadows. And in fact, there are, um, there is uh, salinity in, in the Caspian Sea and there are quite similar seagrass ecosystems in the Caspian Sea uh, to those that occur in other, other uh, more saline marine um, freshwater, sorry, marine water bodies. So um, the analogy in a functional sense is there for that, that group of ecosystems. And of course, um, at the uh, finer levels or lower levels of the typology, those um, seagrass meadows of the Caspian Sea will come out as something really rather different to those, those other systems. But at level three, um, it's interesting that they're represented um, in the same group. It also shows that there's um, bathypelagic ocean waters, which are, which are deep ocean waters. Um, and uh, this, um, <clears throat> this is something that um, raises questions about whether that's, that's really there. And uh, in essence, it's a product of the data that we've used to, uh, to represent the distribution of that particular ecosystem. And uh, we need to investigate further whether there really is anything. There's certainly the depth, but whether the ecosystems resemble anything from the deeper oceans uh, remains to be seen. And it's quite likely um, that um, we might be looking at a spatial error there in, in the spatial data. So I just wanted to show you that to illustrate um, the fact that there are limitations to any spatial data set and uh, that um, you know, caveats apply and that you need to apply some caution and certainly some scrutiny to the spatial data that you're working with. Okay, um, so now um, I'm just going to pop across to uh, the final tab and show you um, uh, the opportunity for feedback. And what we're interested in here is um, any certainly comments, but suggestions about um, new information sources that might help represent or describe the characteristics of um, ecosystems um, in more detail or more accurately than what we've currently been able to. And we're certainly interested in um, um, new uh, map data sets in that regard. And also any suggestions for uh, new functionalities of, of the website. Okay, well, I'm going to uh, jump out of there now and um, we can go back to um, some discussion session. We, we might keep this fairly brief given the time. Um, and in fact, we, we do have the option to combine a discussion here with, um, with our final discussion session. So let's have a look and see how we go. Uh, how many people in other organisations collaborate to advance this? Well, um, it's, uh, I, don't, I can't tell you the exact number, uh, but it's, uh, it's more than 100 at this point and it, it's growing all the time and those people come from uh, I tallied them up the other day there were more than 85 different institutions around the world and uh, and you know that number is is obviously growing as well okay 
Okay, well, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that there's not too many questions coming in and uh, just jump into the final part of the dialogue. Okay, so part three, some, some applications. Um, the, um, here we go. Okay, so many of the applications of the typology relate to synthesis and comparison um, for, between different ecosystems, between different parts of the world and, and so on. But probably most importantly, um, it's a tool for knowledge transfer. And uh, the key properties of the typology that make it suitable for that kind of application transfer of knowledge include the representation of both function and biota uh, through different levels of the hierarchy. It's scalability, as I mentioned earlier in response to one of the questions. Um, the hierarchical structure allows for you know, global scale applications in the upper levels. And, somewhat more local applications um, at the lower levels of the hierarchy. Um, it's comprehensiveness across the entire biosphere in a single conceptual framework um, also enables knowledge transfer in a way that um, would have been difficult um, without a resource like this. And finally, um, we've tried very hard to, to make this, um, this structure um, and the content as simple as possible so that it's available to the, and accessible to the, uh, the broadest possible audience. And perhaps even more importantly, to document the descriptive information as much as possible. Um, there are many data sets that you, uh, you come across um, and that we did in our review that have uh, very interesting um, classifications. But when you drill down to try and understand what the units actually are, there's very limited descriptions. So that's, that's the reason why we put quite a bit of effort into developing detailed descriptions that are, are um, illustrated in a number of different media, including text, images, maps, and diagrams. So in terms of the kinds of applications that are both underway and also potential for the future, they range from um, reporting on global goals, such as the SDGs and, um, and post-2020 CBD targets uh, through to national uh, natural capital accounting, uh, risk assessment through the red list of ecosystems, identification of key biodiversity areas, um, conservation planning and spatial planning about um, where to locate protected areas, for example, and, and how to design boundaries. Um, also ecosystem mon monitoring management and restoration is a particularly um, important usage that I think uh, the typology will develop over time. Uh, research as well, um, it helps to have a framework um, to describe the system that you're working with to uh, an international audience. And finally, through um, environmental education, and we're having to develop a number of initiatives uh, from early school levels um, upwards to tertiary levels that, that will help um, as an education resource and I think the uh, the website is is already embarking down that track as a useful tool. Um, I'm just going to give some very brief examples of the kinds of applications that are emerging at present and uh, one that's generated a bit of interest is through global reporting and tracking the status of ecosystems against um, CBD targets and sustainable development goals for the UN and um, and you know, I guess the, um, the fact of, of this matter is that our current reporting capacity is, is quite limited. And when you read the global reports, uh, the major reports that come out, um, generally we get uh, quite, quite generic and heterogeneous categories that are described. Um, so for example, um, a quantitative description of the status of the world's forests and the world's, uh, the world's oceans um, is given in in the um, um, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment and also the, the IPBES report. Um, but um, 
there are gaps obviously between there are plenty of other freshwater systems and terrestrial systems that are not represented by those those broad categories um, what's going on with those and those reports um, and assessments um, do a good job of uh, picking out some representative case studies to illustrate the kinds of trends that are occurring but at present we don't we're still some way from a systematic framework and um, I think the typology can contribute to structuring a more systematic overview of the status of the world's ecosystems against those international goals. Um, and that hopefully will enable us to uh, answer questions about, you know, which of, of the major ecosystem types are undergoing the most rapid change, um, which are the most and which are the least protected and which are at the greatest risk of collapse. In terms of ecosystem management and restoration, um, I think um, the most powerful um, feature of, of the typology is uh, for this particular application because it enables us to characterise um, the key processes, the key threats, and to identify functionally similar ecosystem types in different places to the one that we're actually working on. And you can see here some examples of uh, of different kinds of ecosystems. Um, for example, you know, the Aral Sea here, which has had a quite, a quite a lot of detailed work done on it, understanding the key processes that sustained that system prior to its collapse <coughs> and transition into, um, into a saltwater body and, um, and ephemeral grasslands. And uh, the key threats that, that led to that process are clearly identifiable through, through water extraction. Um, with climate change also having a role. Um, but the typology also enables us to identify um, similar ecosystems that might be facing similar kinds of, of threats and have similar kinds of key processes that sustain them. And so the learnings that we can apply from the Aral Sea can extend you know, across a whole range of other related kinds of ecosystems. And the same applies to these other examples here um, where ecosystems that have been um, worked on quite a lot, like the sagebrush um, rangelands in North America, <clears throat> um, we can apply what we've learnt about restoring those systems and managing them for sustainability and the kinds of processes that bring them undone and apply that to management of ecosystems in other parts of the world. So in this respect, I think um, as a knowledge transfer tool, the, uh, the typology really has its greatest potential. Another application that we've been uh, collaborating with um, a group um, uh, organised by the uh, United Nations Statistics Division um, has been addressing a revision of uh, the system for environmental accounts, in particular the experimental ecosystem accounts. And that's a process that's been underway for the best part of three years now, I think, and um, it aims to link measures of ecosystem extent, condition, services and values um, in a natural uh, capital accounting system to report on change in, in those ecosystem assets. And uh, a fundamental requirement for that kind of accounting is a consistent classification of assets across studies and across nations and across all environments. And so the, the typology is quite well suited to this, this kind of application. And, um, and in fact, um, the, uh, the review process is, is drawing to a close in the coming months and uh, the typology um, that IUCN has developed of global ecosystems at level three has been adopted as, as a reference classification for those ecosystem assets. And it's undergone a process of testing and review and um, we've been able to link that um, testing and review to de the development of the typology itself and we've had some very useful input um, into the structure of the typology that's come out of that process that's led to revisions of, um, of earlier versions of the typology that you're seeing in version 2.0 now. Um, a lot of these applications require crosswalks. In other words, um, relating those existing established national classifications to the global framework and um, and you know, that's a process that um, can be done uh, because of the detailed descriptions that are available for ecosystem functional groups. 
and uh, if quantitative data are available, um, there are you know, analytical methods that enable uh, those data to be analysed to identify the most likely functional group that any particular map unit from any country around the world could belong to. But failing the availability of those quantitative data, which are, which are often lacking um, in many parts of the world, um, we can use expert uh, elicitation methods, uh, structured methods that enable us to identify um, which local ecosystem types um, uh, belong to particular functional groups. And this example comes from Chile where there's active work going on in, uh, in uh, attributing level six units in the Chilean national classification of vegetation to uh, level three ecosystem functional groups in the global classification. And that work's being led by Patricio Pliskov, who's uh, here on our panel today. Similar work's happening in, in a number of other countries, but some countries don't have any established national um, classification or data infrastructure at all. And uh, one example of, of that case is, is Myanmar, where recently um, we've completed a project um, working with um, World Conservation Society. Um, where, um, where we've started essentially from the ground up uh, to develop a, an information infrastructure on ecosystems for that country. And uh, the global typology um, was developing in tandem with, with this project and it actually provided quite a useful structure for us to develop a national classification for Myanmar. Um, and it helped us identify the knowledge gaps for um, potentially important ecosystems or, or types of ecosystems that um, were likely to be represented within the country um, based on our global data, but where there was very little, if, if any, um, existing uh, local um, uh, data and information about those systems within the country. So Headley Grantham and Nick Murray, who are on the panel, um, were involved in that work and, um, and can certainly take questions. And finally, um, I just want to talk about the, um, the potential future directions that we might explore. Um, clearly, there's lots of work to be done in resolving levels four and five of the typology and, uh, and also for integrating uh, level six from established national classifications. Um, we need to improve the maps, certainly for level three and ultimately level four and integrate those with, with level five. Um, in particular, we need to develop tools for harnessing local observations on ecosystems so that they can be incorporated to improve those spatial data sets. And we need to link established national uh, classifications into that level six. Um, integrating the applications uh, even more than they currently are, like uh, ecosystem accounts is um, an important priority, as well as, um, as at the grassroots level, um, undertaking local case studies in ecosystem management and nature-based solutions so that we can use that knowledge transfer um, capability of, of, the, um, of the typology to share learned experiences. And also new functionalities on the interact uh, interactive website. Um, we'd like to develop an image library, for example, and also ecosystem management resources um, to support that knowledge transfer and finally to develop um, educational resources as well. Um, so I think to sum up, if, if there's a key point about this, um, I think you know, the major potential for this is as a, um, an information and storage and retrieval system uh, that is useful for knowledge transfer. And it certainly works from, from the top down and, and the bottom up, but perhaps much more importantly, um, it's a vehicle for knowledge transfer across the lines where people working in similar systems in different parts of the world can share uh, their learnings. Thanks very much. I'll stop it there and, uh, and open it for discussion and further questions. David, there's a question about um, the typology of ecosystem. How could the typology of ecosystem support nature-based solutions? 
Yeah, thanks, Jose, and thanks, Mohammed, for, for the question. I did touch on nature-based solutions only very briefly there at the end, but I think you know the potential for nature-based solutions lies in um, that, uh, that knowledge transfer capability um, that the typology opens up. And so um, where a nature-based solution is developed and applied and adapted, um, there's learning from mistakes and revision and adaptation, all of that learning um, can be available for transfer if we can relate um, that information to um, other functional groups of ecosystems that share similar characteristics to the one where the nature-based solution has been developed. And, um, and you know, I think there's great potential uh, both informally um, just through knowledge transfer and, and using the terminology um, and a common language around uh, the functional groups that we're working in uh, to represent different ecosystem types. Uh, but also potential um, with some resourcing to develop something more formal um, where we can perhaps have an archive of, of knowledge um, that points to um, information sources that are available for nature-based solutions for different ecosystem functional groups. Um, do any other panel members want to comment um, on that issue? Okay, um, we, we have um, another question from Joseph. He would like to know how others can participate um, to advance the typology. Um, uh, well, uh, I should have said at the beginning of the talk actually that um, that anyone who's not already a member of CEM can join uh, through the um, Commission on Ecosystem Management uh, website. And um, and certainly um, it's, it's a matter of connecting with us through the ecosystem, um, um, the Red List of Ecosystems thematic group uh, within the commission. Uh, and uh, as well as that, um, if there are specific interests in, um, in advancing particular components of the typology um, or um, particular tools, then um, a good way to, to get in touch um, with the developers is to uh, is through the website through the um, the feedback function so and of course there's email as well through the commission yeah David there was another question with which I tried to answer in the chat but probably you can say uh, more about that or some of the other panelists uh, one question is what is the difference between the ecosystem typology and uh, vegetation types or classifications that are already existing. And the other question was about what happens when, when you find an ecosystem that is kind of an anomaly uh, or, or something that is not currently, currently fits in one single functional group. Yeah. Um, or right. or that describes variation or, or transition between functional groups. Yeah, thanks for those, Jose. Um, the, the first one um, about vegetation classifications, um, there's clearly some relationships um, to a number of different vegetation classifications. Um, what makes this a little different is the emphasis on function at the upper levels of the typology. There are some vegetation typologies that represent um, features that relate to function like physiognomy and structure of vegetation that um, clearly have significant implications for how um, vegetated terrestrial ecosystems function. Um, <clears throat> another point to make is that many of the existing terrestrial um, ecosystem classifications exist at national level or sub-national levels and so there is the, um, the opportunity to integrate those with the global framework through uh, level six of the typology. Another important point to make is that um, 
the 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 scope across the entire biosphere which integrates freshwater aquatic as well as marine and even subterranean ecosystem types um, which we haven't taught, touched on much um, today um, means that you know this typology goes well beyond um, where vegetation exists and some uh, vegetation classifications like the international vegetation classification um, that's managed by IAVS and um, and NatureServe and others um, is uh, does go a little beyond vegetation and and uh, addresses some non vegetated um, expressions on land, um, but um, but they don't go into the same extent of um, of um, of non terrestrial um, ecosystems as as what this classification does. Um, yeah. And, and I think if you if you have a look at the structure of some of those other systems like um, the IVC, um, you will see that you know there are some some quite close relationships and some correspondence between the units at particular levels. And um, and certainly uh, with uh, Don Faber Langdon's uh, a contributor to this um, this typology and um, one of our interests in working with Don is the work that he's doing on, on crosswalks between that system and the terrestrial component of, of the global typology. Uh, the other question was about um, ecosystem types that don't seem to fit and, um, and that's a very good question and that, that circumstance I would expect is, is not uncommon. And there are two fundamental reasons why that might occur. Um, the first is that um, because, as I said earlier, we are trying to um, represent a fundamentally continuous um, biosphere into a, an artificial system that's divided up into boxes, into units. And as a consequence, there will always be some uncertainty as to you know, which box a particular system belongs to. And in many of those uncertain cases where something doesn't seem to fit, it'll be because that particular expression is um, intermediate or transitional between existing boxes. And I think, uh, you know, there are, are different ways of representing um, that, that kind of relationship um, uh, by, um, by flagging, um, for example, uh, the membership um, as something that's not necessarily unique, but uh, something that is um, split between, you know, more than one functional group. That's an option that we have available to us. And we can also um, represent um, a particular unit as being a member that, that something that is primarily a member of one particular functional group. So we can operate with unique membership where we need it for a particular application, but we can also represent the uncertainty in transitional systems um, where that applies because of the nature of, of the structure and this tension between continuum versus discrete representations of nature. Um, the second case where um, that kind of anomaly might arise is where we simply don't have uh, a functional group that properly and adequately represents that particular kind of ecosystem. And, you know, that situation has emerged in a few cases as we've developed um, the typology and interacted with a broader and broader uh, group of, of collaborators. And uh, we've learnt about particular systems that don't fit particularly well into uh, the existing scheme. And as that's emerged and we've delved into the available information and scrutinised the comparison of features between those particular ecosystems and the existing set of functional groups. Um, we've made decisions either to broaden the descriptions of, um, of the functional groups or to identify new functional groups. And, you know, those kinds of changes are represented in, in new versions of the typology. Um, and, you know, there are a number of, um, a small number of, of new functional groups that have been added to the, uh, the typology between version one and version two uh, that you'll see in, in comparison of those different versions. So we have the capability to develop the typology over time and uh, as needed, um, there's not a hard schedule to, uh, for release of version three, 
but um, basically as knowledge accumulates, um, um, you know, the working group will make decisions about whether we need a new, a new version at a particular point in time, whether we have enough um, change to, to release a new release. And that obviously has um, implications for continuity of applications. And so uh, entering into new versions is not something that we would do lightly. Um, it would only be where there's a significant advance in, um, in the knowledge base that recognises, um, you know, either the need for a change in the circumscription of the units or in recognition of new units. Okay. I think uh, I think we are actually quite close to time, but um, perhaps uh, I can invite the panel if they have any final remarks um, to make before we close. Uh, Andrew, would you like to unmute yeah, yourself? Yeah. Very, yeah, very briefly, just to pick up on David's last point, I think um, he described the, the ways where you don't get a fit. Um, and one of the most important things for us is, or well, I think from our experience in South Africa, is the value of, of doing the level six um, classification schemes within your, within your region, bearing in mind the global typology, and then looking um, from, the, from the bottom up. And, and as we do that, we get like a really focused lens on, on, on our ecosystems. And then over time, you know, over decades, the global typology will evolve in response to that real detailed look that we will get at the national level. So you really got to keep developing it from the top and the bottom. Most of the discussion today has been about help uh, developing the top end. Um, but we mustn't forget about developing the bottom end because that's really going to help. So you got know, to keep up those efforts at a national level, at a really fine scale level, looking at things. It's very, very valuable. Thanks, Andrew. Um, we have one last question from Mohammed. I'll just comment briefly that um, we think there is potential to a, a, um, for the typology to support the assessments undertaken in, in IFBES. Um, we've had only quite limited opportunities to interact with IFBES at this point, um, and that's not for any reason in particular except resourcing. Um, most of our time has gone into the development of the typology, and it, it means that our opportunities to, uh, to extend and explore applications has been fairly limited. Uh, but clearly um, more of us that are engaged in, in these kinds of applications um, offer more opportunities to, um, to exploit those, those applications. And IFBES, I think, is, is one of those that um, certainly warrants um, uh, some, some further development and discussion. Uh, I might actually hand back to, to Angela now, if you're able to... Um, unmute anyhow to, to close the session. I think um, we may have gone as far as we can in the time available. So thank you very much for everyone for listening and participating.